Throughout history, instances of scientists and doctors exhibiting what could be described as madness in their pursuit of knowledge or attempts to prove hypotheses are not uncommon. This doctor undertook extraordinary measures, including subjecting himself to the ingestion of blood, urine, saliva, and vomit from patients suffering from yellow fever, in a daring attempt to validate his theory. His goal was to challenge the conventional understanding of yellow fever, and prove new insights that he believed to be true. Stubbins Firth's infamous experiments with yellow fever represent one such example. Despite the lack of scientific rigor and ethical considerations, Firth was driven by a firm belief in his hypothesis, that yellow fever was not contagious. Other figures, like Dr. Walter Freeman, who popularized lobotomies as a treatment for mental illness, Dr. John Romulus Brinkley, who promoted goat gland transplants for various ailments, and even Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, whose advocacy for handwashing to prevent the spread of infection, faced ridicule and rejection, do not even come close to the extremity of this experiment. Stubbins Firth's experiments took place during a significant yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in the early 19th century. Yellow fever outbreaks were recurrent and devastating occurrences in many port cities along the eastern seaboard of the United States during the 18th and 19th centuries. Philadelphia, the nation's capital at that time and a bustling port city, was particularly susceptible to these epidemics due to its dense population, warm climate, and thriving shipping trade. Yellow fever epidemics would periodically sweep through the city, causing widespread illness and death, and instilling fear and panic among the population. The 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia marked the largest outbreak of the disease in American history up to that point, with devastating consequences. Claiming as many as 5,000 lives, roughly 10% of the city's population. By the end of September, the situation had escalated to the point where 20,000 people, including government officials, had left the city, only returning after the epidemic had abetted. The impact of the epidemic was felt across racial lines, black nurses, often overlooked and marginalized in society, stepped forward to provide care and support to those afflicted by yellow fever. Additionally, hired men, many of whom were also black, were tasked with the grim duty of removing corpses from the streets and homes of the afflicted. This job was considered dangerous and undesirable, as many people were unwilling to touch the bodies of those who had succumbed to the disease due to fear of contagion. The epidemic also led to discrimination and fear in neighboring towns, where refugees from Philadelphia were often refused entry for fear of spreading the fever. Major port cities such as Baltimore and New York City, implemented quarantines against refugees and goods from Philadelphia, though the latter offered financial assistance amidst the crisis. Despite its prevalence, the understanding of yellow fever at the time was limited, and often based on speculation rather than scientific evidence. The prevailing theories about the cause of yellow fever ranged from miasma, the belief that diseases were spread through foul-smelling air to contagion, the idea that the disease was transmitted directly from person to person or through contaminated objects, however there was little consensus among medical practitioners, and many theories lacked empirical support. In the midst of a yellow fever epidemic, the urgency to find answers and solutions was palpable. Medical practitioners and civic leaders were under immense pressure to understand the nature of the disease, and develop effective strategies for prevention and treatment. Firth, a young physician who had joined the University of Pennsylvania in 1801 to study medicine, was determined to prove that yellow fever was not contagious. This belief contradicted the prevailing medical understanding of the time, which largely attributed the spread of the disease to person-to-person -person contact or exposure to contaminated environments. Stubbins Firth, the American trainee doctor, became so convinced of his belief that yellow fever was not contagious, that he began to perform experiments on himself. Despite the risks involved, Firth was determined to prove his hypothesis through direct experimentation on none other than himself. 
Firth devised a series of experiments to test his hypothesis, and collected bodily fluids such as vomit, urine, blood, and saliva from patients suffering from yellow fever. These samples were obtained from hospitals, quarantine areas, or directly from afflicted individuals. Undeterred by the grave risks involved, he made deliberate incisions on his arms and smeared infected vomit into the open wounds, purposefully exposing himself to potentially infectious particles in a bold attempt to ascertain the mode of transmission. Underscoring his commitment to his cause, he took his experimentation to unprecedented levels by pouring the infected vomit directly onto his eyeballs, hoping to introduce the virus directly into his system. However, still undaunted by the potential consequences, he even went as far as inhaling the fumes emanating from fried vomit, convinced that this unorthodox method might facilitate the transmission of the disease. Determined by the lack of illness resulting from his direct exposure to infected bodily fluids, Firth escalated his audacious experiments to unprecedented levels of risk, and embarked on a perilous course of action by ingesting the very same infected bodily fluids that he had previously subjected himself to. By willingly ingesting the vomit of yellow fever patients, he explained that he simply sought to expose himself directly to the virus in a desperate bid to contract the disease, and thereby disprove the conventional thoughts of the time. Throughout the experiments, he meticulously observed himself for signs and symptoms of yellow fever. He also recorded detailed observations of his physical condition, including temperature, pulse, and any symptoms he experienced, all of which were documented in written notes or journals, providing a record of Firth's experimental procedures and findings. Despite his repeated exposures to infected bodily fluids, Firth did not contract yellow fever. He interpreted this as proof of his hypothesis, that yellow fever was non-contagious and not spread through direct contact, with or exposure to infected individuals. The second experiment, surprisingly involved a human child and an infant chimpanzee. It yielded numerous conclusions, but also sparked considerable curiosity and debate among scientists and the public alike. In the 1930s, two psychologists aimed to study the development of an infant chimpanzee raised alongside a human child. Winthrop Kellogg, a psychologist, and his wife Luella, were intrigued by questions surrounding the nature of human and animal intelligence, communication, and social behavior. They sought to investigate these topics by conducting a unique experiment, involving the rearing of a baby chimpanzee alongside their own human child. Since his student days, Kellogg has harbored a deep-seated fascination with the intricacies of animal behavior, particularly the similarities and differences between humans and other primates. He was also fascinated by the concept of wild children, or children raised without any human contact in natural settings. However, he recognized the ethical concerns inherent in such scenarios, as abandoning a human child in the wilderness would be morally reprehensible and dangerous. Instead, Kellogg envisioned an experiment that would explore the reverse scenario, bringing an infant animal into human civilization. On June 26, 1931, the Kelloggs obtained a young female chimpanzee, named Gua, who was approximately seven and a half months old at the time. Gua was born on November 15, 1930, in Havana, Cuba, and was given alongside her mother Patty and her father Jack to the Old Orange Park, Florida, site of the Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center on May 13, 1931. Both Gua and their son Donald were raised in a strikingly similar manner, receiving identical care, support, attention, and nurturing from the Kellogg family members. They shared the same living environment, ate meals together, and slept in similar arrangements, ensuring exposure to the same daily routines and experiences. Gua and Donald engaged in regular social interactions, playtime, 
and bonding experiences with family members, fostering a sense of connection and belonging within the household. From the beginning, they were immersed in an environment where language and communication played a central role. They were actively included in conversations and interactions with family members, providing exposure to human language and social interaction from an early age. Whether sharing meals at the dinner table or assisting with household tasks, both Gua and Donald were fully integrated into the family's daily life. What's more, Gua was treated with the same care, attention, and affection as any other child in the family, emphasizing her status as a valued member of the household. This approach not only facilitated Gua's social and cognitive development but also allowed for direct comparisons between her behavior and that of Donald. From the outset, Gua was treated exactly as if she were just another child in the family. The rigorous approach of the Kelloggs, raising both Gua and Donald in precisely the same manner, allowed for direct comparisons between their developmental trajectories and behaviors. They carefully observed and documented all behaviors, interactions, and developmental milestones, including details such as blood pressure, memory, body size, scribbling, reflexes, depth perception, vocalization, locomotion, reactions to tickling, strength, manual dexterity, problem solving, fears, equilibrium, play behavior, climbing, obedience, grasping, language comprehension, attention span and others. However, despite receiving the same care from the family, when Gua was one year old, she exhibited advanced abilities compared to Donald in certain tasks. Gua outperformed Donald in tasks such as responding to simple commands and using objects like a cup and spoon. Additionally, slight differences were noted in their methods of people recognition, with Gua recognizing individuals based on their clothes and smell, while Donald relied on facial recognition. As Gua progressed through Kellogg's experiment, she demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to mimic human behaviors. Notably, Gua began to emulate actions observed in the household, such as attempting to use basic utensils like cups, mirroring the actions of the human family members during mealtimes. Furthermore, Gua showed a keen interest in vocal communication and made efforts to imitate human speech patterns. While her vocalizations did not achieve the complexity of human language, she attempted to produce sounds resembling words and phrases spoken by the Kellogg family. However as Gua continued to mature within the Kellogg household, her innate chimpanzee instincts gradually became more dominant, and she began to exhibit behaviors characteristic of her species. Despite her upbringing in a human environment, Gua's genetic predisposition and natural instincts as a chimpanzee asserted themselves as she grew older. One noticeable change was her increased inclination towards activities such as climbing, swinging, vocalizing in chimpanzee sounds, displaying signs of aggression, and exploring her surroundings in a manner more typical of chimpanzees in the wild. While she initially mimicked human behaviors and adapted to the household environment, Gua's transition to more chimpanzee-like behaviors, such as her innate need for physical activity, exploration, and expression of her chimpanzee nature, became apparent, and the influence of her genetic heritage became dominant. Additionally, despite initial expectations of Gua adopting humanoid behaviors, an unexpected outcome emerged as their own child Donald began to exhibit behaviors more reminiscent of chimpanzees. Ultimately, after nine months, Winthrop and his wife made the decision to end the experiment, due to Gua's growing size and the emergence of her innate chimpanzee behaviors, which posed potential risks to the safety of their child. Her natural instincts as a chimpanzee, such as increased aggression, destructiveness, and difficulty in controlling her growing strength and physical capabilities, raised concerns about her potential to inadvertently harm Donald or other family members during play or interaction. Due to such non-humanoid behaviors, she became challenging to manage within the confines of a domestic setting. The conclusion drawn from the experiment conducted was that despite their efforts to raise Gua alongside Donald, and provide her with a nurturing environment, she ultimately remained fundamentally a chimpanzee, and was unable to fully assimilate into human society.
The third experiment delved into a surgical procedure, often dubbed a radical method by some, sparking ethical concerns due to its unconventional approach to extending life. This experiment raised eyebrows as it sought to push the boundaries of life extension through unconventional means, prompting discussions about the ethical implications of such endeavors. Sergei Brukhanenko's doghead experiment stands as another landmark in the history of medical science. Sergei Sergeyevich Brukhanenko, a prominent Soviet physician, biomedical scientist, and technologist, made pioneering contributions to transplantation, blood circulation, artificial organs, and cardiovascular surgery during the Stalinist era. Born on April 30, 1890, he played a vital role in developing open-heart procedures in Russia after graduating from Moscow State University, and later becoming a professor at the Military Medical Academy in Leningrad. He was associated with the Research Institute of Experimental Surgery, collaborating with Professor Alexander Vishnevsky, who performed the first Soviet open-heart operation in 1957. Brukhanenko's most notable achievement was the autojector, one of the earliest heart and lung machines. This groundbreaking innovation facilitated the circulation of blood and oxygen outside the body, maintaining vital functions during surgical procedures. Operating on the principle of extracorporeal circulation, the autojector temporarily diverted blood from the body, oxygenated it and then returned it to the circulatory system. Its basic components included a pump, an oxygenator, and tubing connecting the device to the patient's blood vessels. Conducted in the early 20th century in the Soviet Union, Brukhanenko's experiment aimed to push transplantation techniques boundaries, by exploring the feasibility of maintaining a severed dog's head alive outside its body, and potentially transplanting it onto another body. This experiment unfolded amid a burgeoning interest in transplantation and organ function, fueled by advancements in understanding blood circulation and surgical techniques. Brukhanenko embarked on this audacious venture to demonstrate the potential for reattaching a severed head to a new body, challenging conventional notions of life and identity. Central to his experiment was the autojector, a sophisticated apparatus designed to artificially circulate blood and oxygen through isolated organs, providing a lifeline for the severed head, and allowing it to remain functional and responsive even after detachment. The transplantation procedure began with surgically removing the head of one dog, requiring precise incisions to minimize tissue damage. Simultaneously, the recipient dog's body was prepared for transplantation. After careful attachment of the donor dog's head to the recipient's body, blood vessels were connected to establish blood flow to the transplanted head. To ensure the transplanted head's viability, mechanisms for oxygenation and nutrient supply were necessary. The experiment involved two mechanically operated diaphragm pumps, with valves designed to oxygenate the blood and remove carbon dioxide. These pumps mimic the heart and lungs functions, facilitating blood circulation and gas exchange. The blood passed through the oxygenator, where carbon dioxide was removed and oxygen was added. Valve systems regulate blood and oxygen flow throughout the apparatus, sustaining the transplanted head's oxygenation and circulation. Throughout the experiment, Brukhanenko and his team closely monitored the transplanted head's viability, observing responsiveness to stimuli and physiological functions. While attached to the autojector, the head displayed signs of life, responding vigorously to external stimuli such as sounds and light. Astonishingly, it even exhibited behaviors typical of a living dog, willingly consuming offered slices of cheese. However, despite the initial hope brought by the head's vitality while connected to the autojector, its resurrection proved short-lived. Within hours, the head's functionality began to wane until the spark of life dissipated, and the head ceased to function. While showcasing surgical advancements and artificial organ development, notably with the autojector machine, 
The experiment also sparked significant ethical inquiries regarding animal treatment and scientific inquiries' ethical limits. Manipulating living organisms prompted profound questions about life's essence, individual identity, and the ethical treatment of animals in research. Critics denounced the experiment as unethical and morally objectionable, igniting heated discussions within the scientific community and society at large, leading to various conspiracy theories.